welcome everyone for this uh, talk on corrective maneuvers in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis and uh, my job today is to take you through the history of uh, instrumentation for uh, idiopathic scoliosis and how it evolved and actually by understanding the history uh, you get a good idea about what were the different corrective maneuvers that were used in different eras so let's start with the first instrumentation that was designed by Paul Harrington um, and this essentially was an instrumentation that was <clears throat> uh, uh, used to distract the ends of the curve uh, like this uh, with, a, with a rod known as Harrington rod so it worked on the distraction principle actually he also introduced the concept of convex side compression to reduce the curvature on the convexity. So he, he proposed both the concave distraction maneuver as well as the convex uh, compression maneuver. This was introduced during this era. And this worked quite well for thoracic curves. You can see this uh, case I have taken from the most textbook of uh, scoliosis from 1994. You can see this is a double uh, major curve, actually a false double major. And you can see that there is a Harrington rod placed here only in the thoracic region for a selective thoracic fusion. And uh, there are sublaminar wires attached here to the Harrington rod. This, this was called the Leeds procedure. And you can see eight year outcome of this uh, uh, procedure worked quite well in, in the thoracic spine. But the problem with the Harrington instrumentation that it neglected the sagittal profile, especially in the lumbar spine. So if you distract between two points in the lumbar spine, what you are going to get is a flat back. So this is what happened uh, to um, when Harrington instrumentation uh, was used. It caused a flat back um, syndrome. So the lesson learned from a distraction and compression instrumentation is that if you are going to distract in the concavity of the curve, what you are going to achieve is that you are going to get more kyphosis uh, in the sagittal plane and so in the sagittal plane your kyphosis increases so distraction essentially is kyphogenic in the spine because you're distracting on the posterior elements so distraction in the concavity of the curve to correct the concavity is going to increase the kyphosis uh, in the spine which is not so good in the lumbar spine but it is desirable in the thoracic spine it is opposite in the lumbar spine. In the lumbar spine, you have you want to compress on the convexity of the curve so that in the sagittal profile you recreate the lordosis. So this was the concept during learned during this time. The second era was the Lucky era, and this in this era, the correction was segmental correction. So you had a rod and then segmentally with sublaminar wires the vertebral bodies were translated towards the rod so you can he see here lucky rods here and sublaminar wires that have translated the rod towards uh, translated the spine towards the rod and uh, and the he had the first thought about sagittal uh, correction by bending the rod so if you sagittally bend the rod in a curvature then you can translate the column not only in the coronal plane but also in the sagittal plane towards the rod. So the problems with this instrumentation was this: this was only a translational correction of the spinal deformity. There was no derotation and as we know that uh, the scoliosis is a three-dimensional deformity. So the, the lumbar, rib prominence was not corrected and a lot of patients required a thoracoplasty. So the lessons learned from this instrumentation that segmental correction was quite powerful and resulted in a better correction than Harrington instrumentation. It was very rigid and did not require any post of bed rest or casting that was required for Harrington instrumentation in the past. It controlled the sagittal profile by controlling the contouring of the rods that you could do. But the wires were a neurological risk because they go into the spinal canal and eventually they were replaced by hooks and pedicle screws but over a time uh, 
um, the wires uh, in in the spine are still used quite often and the neurological risk is not as great as others but now because instrumentation has evolved to something better all all wire constructs are not very commonly used nowadays you use wires only for say salvage uh, uh, situations or translating the apex in uh, in more rigid situations so the third era was the cd instrumentation era where the anchors were hooks instead of the wires and this is cotrell and this is dubusey and these were the two french guys who invented this instrumentation and the brilliant idea of this instrumentation was the global rod d rotation maneuver so one day they were trying to instrument the spine with these hooks and they could not get the rod uh, along into these hooks easily and their resident gave them an idea that why don't you put the rod in this uh, curvature like this and de rotate it towards this side so that automatically the spine uh, will come in alignment so that led to this description of the rod de rotation maneuver so essentially you are you are putting the rod in the concavity of the curve and then rotating it like this so that once it comes in the sagittal profile the deformity also corrects the other thing which hook instrumentation allowed was segmental compression and distraction until um, up, up until now harrington instrumentation allowed you to distract only at the ends right but this instrumentation allowed you to compress between two hooks very close to each other or distract between two hooks that were very close to each other so that was the new method of correction that was added to it so what was the problem with the cd instrumentation the cd instrumentation even though the rod de rotates it does not really de rotate the spine it does not correct the apical um, rotational deformity so the rip prominence correction was not very good it only works mostly as a translational maneuver even the rod de rotation maneuver essentially translates the apex towards the midline it doesn't really de rotate the apical vertebra in con in the contrary it actually increases the axial deformity by worsening the rib hump because the hooks don't control the anterior column what it did that when you de rotate the uh, rod the rib prominence got larger so to prevent that what they did was they advised that you should press down on on the rib hump but when you press down on the rib hump what happens is that you induce uh, hypokyphosis remember the spine is already hypokyphotic in ais if you press down on the ribs like this you are going to induce more hypokyphosis in the spine the other problem with cd instrumentation was increased decompensation because now you are applying harrington era uh, uh, principles to cd uh, instrumentation which was much more powerful so it corrected the uh, deformities to a much larger extent than the compensatory curves uh, that could compensate for that deformity correction so decompensation was noted much more uh, in partly this was also because of that rod de rotation maneuver where the torsional forces uh, they could not be Uh, controlled that were transmitted to the unfused area of the spine it had no control over de rotation because unlike pedicle screws the hooks only hold on the posterior element and the rod de rotation maneuver actually unbends the uh, uh, rod much more than just the translation maneuver so when you are putting the rod here and try to de rotate it the the rod when it is coming in this position it it unbends quite more significantly than if you would have used the translational maneuver and the last point was that the cob angle the coronal cob did not always match with the sagittal curvature here what you are trying to do is that this curvature has to match the sagittal uh, curvature for you to for you to effectively uh, correct this deformity so these were the disadvantages not only of the cd instrumentation but of the global rod de rotation maneuver so the lessons learnt was that rod de rotation maneuver does not is not equivalent to a vertebral de rotation maneuver the rod de rotation maneuver especially if you are using on a single rod uh, you can worsen the apical uh, rotation 
uh, even if you are using screws and the uh, what what they advise for that is to counter it by pressing down on the rip prominence on the convexity but this is not usually a good idea because it reduces the uh, kyphosis then came the segmental pedicle screw era this person is sook and this person is lenky and these guys were instrumental in bringing this uh, phase where we are living right now and the key trick in this instrumentation is basically vertebral translation like how lucky instrumentation was but what it is trying to do is that you are putting reduction screws in the concavity of the deformity then you are placing the rod in the normal sagittal profile and then dragging the vertebral column towards the rod using these reduction screws so this was a segmental translation uh, maneuver the uh, professor sook from korea described the direct vertebral uh, rotation a maneuver which would correct segmentally the uh, axial uh, deformity of the vertebra so as the pedicle holds all three columns of the vertebra by holding the pedicle screw with these long handles you could potentially derotate the, the vertebra in the correct alignment and this prevented the need for for thoracoplasty but what were the problems you know for this derotation maneuver again they described that you need to press down on the rib prominence to correct this uh, rotation and that also induced hypokyphosis or increased the hypokyphosis so there are a lot of papers which uh, have shown that all pedicle screw construct especially if you are using a soft rod like titanium will cause a decrease in the sagittal contour of the thoracic spine plus putting pedicle screws at every single level was expensive and there is always a risk of the screw plowing out especially if the this is the concave the pedicle screw and if you push it this way it can plow, plow out uh, like this and there is an aorta sitting here right here and if you if you are pushing it that way this screw can plow inside the spinal canal so these were the risk of you know pushing uh, and pulling on the screws to derotate the um, vertebral body but this is still a quite commonly used technique to uh, correct the deformity in three dimension and nowadays with such powerful instrumentation uh, the correction in three dimension is is much better and uh, you don't really need a thoracoplasty for the usual adolescent idiopathic scoliosis so one important concept that everybody should understand is the three dimensional nature of the sagittal plane in ais so this is a good paper by peter newton that you can uh, refer to here if you see uh, the three dimensional uh, picture in the ap view and the lateral view looks as if the thoracic spine is in kyphosis but if you eliminate the curvature and put the uh, segmental vertebra on top of each each other between every two vertebra there is a lordosis induced by the deformity so if you remove the scoliosis it actually looks like this with quite a bit of uh, lordosis uh, in the th thoracic spine and your aim basically of surgery is to drag the apex outwards so that you can restore the sagittal profile as well so you can see the vertebra is right here rotated into the chest uh, on on this side and you want to drag the vertebral body not only derotate it like this into correct alignment but its position also has to be pulled backwards that's the apical vertebra in the lateral view you want to move the apical vertebra backwards because it is in hypokyphotic position means it is a it is more anterior than what it is supposed to be and on the ap view you want to get the apex from the laterally deviated position to midline to correct the curb angle so these are the correction translational things that you want the apex to um, move to with your instrumentation so there are three ways to avoid hypokyphosing effect of all pedicle screw constructs all pedicle screw constructs uh, have a tendency to make the uh, thoracic spine flat because of all those reasons that we i mentioned before so what you do is use a stiff rod use like a cobalt chrome rod use differential rod contouring we'll see what is that second is use ponty releases which 
releases the posterior column which you can lengthen so remember if you lengthen the posterior column you are inducing kyphosis in the thoracic spine and the third is concave side distraction as we saw in the harrington era instrumentation if you distract on the concavity you are going to induce kyphosis so uh, concave side distraction in the thoracic spine is going to increase the kyphosis in the sagittal plane so you can do all these maneuvers to make sure that along with the coronal cop correction you are getting a good sagittal profile as well what you want to avoid if possible is the rod derotation maneuver during which was used during the cd era because the rod derotation maneuver not only unbends the rod much more but it also <coughs> can result in uh, abnormal torsional forces being transmitted to the unfused uh, area of the spine and it's not as effective in bringing out the apex out of the chest don't do convex side compression because that's going to reduce the amount of kyphosis don't press down on the rib prominence like i said before and don't use a titanium rod because titanium rod is too soft and when you try to correct using titanium rod the titanium rod is what bends rather than the spine coming towards the rod so what is differential rod contouring differential rod contouring means the concave rod you are curving much more than the kyphosis that you want to achieve uh, in the thoracic spine and the convex rod you are bending much lesser or you are bending much flatter than the sagittal profile that you want to achieve what it does is that the concave rod sits like this in the normal anatomical position you lock it at one end and you drag these uh, screws towards the rod so you are basically taking out the hypokyphotic apex from the chest and getting it uh, to to the uh, a rod that is overbent mind you all metal will unbend a little bit but cobalt chrome unbends lesser so even if you over contour the rod it is going to come back to a more flatter position probably a normal thoracic contour and end there the convex rod is much flatter and a lesser contour and what it is supposed to be doing is push the convex side downwards so if your convex rod is lesser contoured it pushes the vertebra this way and if your concave rod is sitting far off from the spine it is going to pull this pedicle outwards so automatically the convex rod pushes this down and the concave rod pulls this outwards so that the vertebral body derotates so most of your derotation is going to happen because of this maneuver which is what uh, is a very simple thing to do right and as i have discussed before cobalt chrome rod is 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 stiff than titanium rod and it is better to achieve uh, sagittal profile contouring with a cobalt chrome rod than titanium the fixation anchors the most commonly used ones are the pedicle screws mono axial screw, screws are very unforgiving although they are very strong and have a low profile but most of the time we are preferring these two types of screws so polyaxial screws everybody knows but the problem with polyaxial screws is that you cannot effectively derotate the um, the vertebra using polyaxial screws so for that you have uniplanar screws in uniplanar screws the screw uh, the threads or the barrel only moves in one plane it doesn't move in the mediolateral plane so if if the mediolateral there is no uh, movement of the screw then you can derotate the vertebra on on this screw so uniplanar screws are good for uh, direct vertebral uh, rotation so this is direct vertebral rotation there are two types of direct vertebral rotation maneuvers described the n block maneuver and the segmental maneuver i mean i usually don't follow the n block maneuver in n block maneuver what you do is that you attach these long uh, tubes to the screws lock them in and then connect these tubes with each other and left side connected to the right side and then n block rotate the apex uh, d rotate the apex so uh, this is an n block uh, maneuver and n block maneuver uh, actually uh, helps uh, distribute the load over these screws so that you don't force one screw uh, into d rotation otherwise they can plow out segmental vertebral derotation means that you are segmentally derotating so if you are going quadad to cephalad so this is the tail end uh, 
uh, and this if your liv is new, in neutral position you ask your assistant to hold it like this and at the next level you get the uh, vertebra aligned to that so at at every level you start uh, doing it and getting it higher and higher until the uh, vertebral uh, column derotates so that's what the N dvr uh, means or direct vertebral rotation means but remember the direct vertebral rotation can be lordogenic if you are not careful especially while doing this maneuver if you are pressing down on the rib hum so don't do that so uh, this requires more surgery because you require more screws at the concave apex we have discussed the problem of screw plowing out with the end block maneuver so that is about it about the different corrective maneuvers in ais one more corrective maneuver is a translational or oh sorry cantilever maneuver that is usually done for uh, hyperkyphotic apex so i don't know if i have a picture yeah so here so this is the cantilever maneuver where you have uh, a hyperkyphosis uh, so you don't put the concave rod for a hyperkyphotic apex you use the convex side uh, rod to press down on the hyperkyphosis to correct it so that is called the cantilever maneuver it is rare to have hyperkyphosis in ais curves so this is not usually a very commonly used uh, surgical maneuver so just to uh, 